also known as Gorilla, is AIM's leading source of information for Asian family businesses. The Gorilla Professional Chair was established in 2012 from the generosity of renowned family business leaders from India, Mr. Vasa Kumar Birla and his late wife, Honorable Mrs. Sarala Birla. For the last six years, the professional chair has undertaken several research, education, and service activities to advance knowledge in family business sustainability. One such activity is this today, the Breakfast Forum series. The Berlin Breakfast Forum is intended to be a platform to engage with prominent family business leaders, scholars, advisors, and non-family leaders, and discuss specific themes that are unique to family-owned and managed firms. This could help advance the learning on how to hurdle the challenges associated with growing the family business. Today's topic Traversing the Family Business Path, Insights from Non-Family Leaders will zero in on the experiences and learnings of non-family business leaders working in family businesses. They will share with us their stories, the challenges they faced in managing family businesses. Our speakers for today are highly esteemed in their respective fields. They will have 10 minutes each for their presentation. After all the presentations, there will be a Q&A session wherein the participants can ask the invited speakers to share their views on your questions and issues. We have distributed pieces of papers to our audiences, which they can use to write their questions that will arise from the presentations. The audience may give it to our um, staff around the area later on as the speakers and talks progress, so that we can ask them during our Q&A session. For our first speaker, it is my pleasure to introduce Mr. Gaz Puno. Mr. Puno is currently the president of First Philippine Holdings Corporation, one of the largest industrial conglomerates in the Philippines. He is also concurrently the president and chief operating officer of First Gen Corporation. Mr. Puno completed his Master of Management degree in Northwestern University's Kellogg Graduate School of Management in 1990, and his Bachelor of Science degree in Business Management from the Ateneo de Manila University in 1985. Everybody, please welcome me in joining Mr. Gales Puno. myself uh, on top of uh, the introductory comments um, uh, so after after my master's degree I started uh, I worked for Chase Manhattan Bank uh, in the regional investment bank responsible for infrastructure uh, financing so our main focus was really mobilizing large-scale financing for infrastructure projects like power plants uh, so I advised many groups, including here in the Philippines, on projects uh, in, as part of the privatization program here as well. Um, and then I joined the group, the Lopez Group, in uh, 1997. Uh, at that time, I was still living in Singapore, uh, in the regional office of Chase, Invest Chase, um, uh, Chase Manhattan Bank. Ricky um, Kibun Cho, who you hear later, was a colleague of mine. I think he was based in Hong Kong, I was based in Singapore. Um, but uh, in 1997, so I moved back here. So I've been back in the country for the last 20 years. And uh, when I joined the group, um, uh, just by way of background, the Lopez Group was founded in 1928. So it's 90 years old. Um, first Philippine Holdings, which I had, was set up in 1961. Uh, so it's, uh, it's a relatively old company. But our businesses are really focused on power generation. About 10 years ago, um, at that time, our, our now uh, Chairman Emeritus, Oscar Lopez, asked our communications guys and management to come up with here, what we have here, which we call the Lopez Credo. I think this is helpful for, 
for family-owned businesses because it sort of is a guiding principle of what we do uh, in the Lopez Group. So every time we have um, a forum, every time we have meetings, uh, we start off, uh, you know, uh, group meetings by reciting this credo. Uh, and if you look at it, um, it's actually sort of, sort of a big picture uh, representation of what the group represents. So let me say it. We, so we, we all, we all, all of us would have, would have stood up and, 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 and started to look at this. We as employees of the local group of companies <coughs> believe that our primary reason for being is to serve God and the Filipino people. So first, it was only Filipino people in the first draft. And, uh, and OML, like who you referred to self are, said, this, it's not complete. You have to say, you have to serve God and the Filipino people. So he was very particular about that. And then, we shall always conduct ourselves in a manner that is mindful of the long-term mutual benefit of the group and the various publics we serve. It, it's an interpretation that we really go beyond simply prof, the profit motive. Uh, that when we make investments, it's not short-term in perspective, but long-term in perspective. Uh, we will be responsible stewards of all our resources, uh, conscious of our obligation to present and future generations not only of the Lopez family, but also the various bodies we serve. So, as you can see, what we really look at are investments that have a long-term sort of view. And that's, that's, I think, important to us. And it, it also is a guiding principle of why we make certain decisions. So, and then since 1928, again, that's already founded, and years and genera gener generations to follow are committed to the distinctive Lopez values will, will, will not change. So it, these are, these are sort, of, sort of carved in stone as we remain committed to our stakeholders. So that's the credo. And then we move on to Lopez Values, the next page. Uh, yeah, right here. Fun way, yeah. here. This one. So the Lopez Values, so we're explicit about in our service to the Filipino people, we will be guided by the following Lopez Values. A pioneering entrepreneurial spirit, business excellence, Unity, nationalism, social justice, uh, integrity, employee welfare and wellness. I think what makes us unique, actually, when we, we, we go through this, are more specifically, probably not pioneering entrepreneurial spirit, because everybody, after all, does that. I think it's the social justice and nationalism uh, attributes that makes us a bit unique, uh, in the sense that you know, again, you're there to profit, but on the other hand, as part of your value is social justice. So that, that again, is a guiding principle of what we represent. And of course, integrity and employee welfare and wellness. We believe that it's uh, from, from, by following these that, you know, we will be built to last. And that's, uh, so that, that's part of the guiding principle by which, uh, you know, I think families can sort of Sort of uh, focus on okay, what do they re really represent, and we don't mind it even if it's obvious. <laughs> um, so, the second point I wanted to address is governance, um, because obviously family businesses, uh, by its nature, will have uh, will will, will uh, hopefully when they when they as they succeed, will grow, and. Um, so you have, you have sort of uh, to develop a, a corporate governance structure. So what I asked our, our guys yesterday is can you, can you sort of uh, create a, uh, a, a chart of just simply pictures of our board of directors. So we have a 15 man board of directors of which there are four Lopez family members. Our chairman emeritus is Oscar Lopez. Our chairman, current chairman and CEO is uh, Federico Lopez. I am the president of First Philippine Holdings. Manuel Lopez is the vice chairman. Gabby Lopez is also part of the board of directors. Obviously, he's more involved in the media business. But the rest, uh, we have we have four um, independent directors, and that's that's part of the governance. SSS is is has a representative because they have a, they have some shareholdings in in uh, in, uh, in the company. And the rest are what we call non uh, non executive uh, in, uh, non, -exec non executive directors. 
voted in by the, the locus group. So that effectively, that's, that creates a, a layer where you bring in independence into, the, into, into your governance. This is the senior management. There are, if you look at the executive, our, exe our own executive committee comprises only one locus member, and that's the chairman and CEO. The rest are all professionals. So there are other Lopez family members in the company, but their their focus is on certain specific roles, and they are actually not in the executive committee. So they, their their function is, for example, one is responsible for certain sort of uh, property, certain properties. The other is responsible for our uh, sort of um, aviation uh, aviation subsidiary. But the rest of the the rest of the management is professional management. Um, and what we try to do is, of course, professionalize it more and more. And we feel we're in a, we're, we're in a uh, I guess because of the credo, because of the values, because of what we represent, that we can hire really top-notch uh, uh, professional managers. Just, uh, and why do we need that? It's because of a corporate structure like this, where we manage about 350 billion pesos worth of assets, many of which are operating companies. And so when you look at our property business, probably most, the most famous one there would be Rockwell Land. But um, we also have uh, a relatively large industrial park business. We also have some manufacturing. We manufacture many of the sort of the distribution transformers to supply the electricity industry. But our biggest investment is in power generation, which is a company called First Gen, and another subsidiary called EDC, which is focused on renewable energy. And so today, I am the president of both, uh, actually three, uh, the president of First Philippine Holdings, the parent, the president of First Gen, which is our biggest investment, contributing 85% 80, of our profits. And in the balance, I'm also currently the president of the industrial park. But again, as you can see from this, um, as you can imagine, you would have thought that if it was a purely family-run business that, that continues to be first generation, that you see them all over the place here. But we have really transitioned because of the fact that you know we were first established in 1928. We're now in third generation. And in the context of being in third generation, um, we have, a, at least our chairman, our current chairman the CEO has a philosophy that uh, just because you're a family member doesn't mean that you would, you would have a job. Because it's, it's his view that in order for you to attract the best professionals, it will be difficult for you to hire a, a family member <coughs> with, uh, that does not have the relevant experience. So he would prefer that even, and he gets a lot of pressure to hire family members, as you can imagine. Uh, so it's, it's, it continues to be a, a topic of sort of uh, a, a lot of family conversation. But nonetheless, I think he's, he's sort of drawn the line to say, okay, moving forward, we want you to you know, develop a career outside of the group, and then what we'd like for you is to invite you in, because we know that you'll be even be better than a, a, you know, a, a professional manager that you can hire for that same position. That's, so that's, uh, that's really all I wanted to do, and then I'll just focus on the Q&A later on. Thank you very much.
She serves as the Operations and Finance Officer of Household Development Corporation and Palmera Homes Incorporated. Ms. Delphine graduated magna cum laude from the University of the Philippines at Los Baños with a degree of Bachelor of Science in Agribusiness. She also has a master's degree in business management here from the Asian Institute of Management. Please join me in welcoming Ms. Delphine. So it's just second generation, but really the one who's driving it is still Mr. Manny Vidyar. So 
the culture and the values was what I had to learn as a professional. How long did it take me to learn it? Probably six months because I was so eager when I first joined them. When I rejoined them four years ago, because I still basically got my senior position and I was still given senior responsibilities, it took me one and a half years. So basically the company grew from 600 employees to about almost 4,000 now. So we had resources which I had to learn how to access and know who are the people, the key people in the past 43 years who had a major role in decision making. But this is the other difference again. We did not have um, the governance now, I'll go to that. We did not have an organizational structure that can be drawn. We did not have a formal board. But we have exicoms, which can be created by Mr. Villar, depending on what the topic is. And, and those exicoms are, I, I have to go through them to, to basically come up with a project for the concept, business concept, and for funding. And then finally, I'm given the legal go signal, okay, create the corporation and break it, and then uh, basically build it, run it from ground level. So that's all I could say. It's kind of unique in that sense that it's first generation, we have the values which are really family values, even though you may call them corporate values. And really, we don't have an organizational structure that's formal, but the informal is really looking at, it's not politics, it's really people who are very competent, who have the ability to basically, I don't believe in multitasking personally, who have the ability to have uh, multiple perspectives <coughs> and use them in coming up with a decision. So that's all I can say. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ms. Duncan. Another round of applause for Ms. Duncan. Our next speaker is Mr. Frederick DeVuncho. Mr. DeVuncho is President and Chief Executive Officer of SM Investments Corporation and To Go Group Incorporated. He is the Vice Chairman of the Board of Atlas Consolidated Mining and Development Corporation and Director of Phoenix Petroleum Philippines Incorporated. He has worked and lived in several major cities, including New York, Seoul, Bangkok, Hong Kong, and Manila. He graduated from the Ateneo de Manila University with a Bachelor of Science degree in Business Management and finished a Master's degree in Business Administration here at the Asian Institute of Management. Everybody, please join me in welcoming our next speaker, Mr. Frederick de Bucha. Um, good morning, first of all, to everyone here. I guess common denominators were all ex-bankers. So, uh, I wonder whether ex-bankers make better managers in family-owned businesses, but that seems to be the trend here. Um, just as a background as well, I've always been a professional banker like Giles before joining the corporate world. Uh, I was also with a foreign multinational bank. Um, the last was the merger, J.P. Morgan Chase. So I was there for over 22 years. And I thought I retired. I actually took a sabbatical for about four years. And it was then that um, Tessie C. Cawson, who basically is the eldest of the siblings of um, in the C family, was sending me emails, inviting me to join the group, no? asking what I was doing in the US then. Uh, was I not getting bored? Do I want to come back to the Philippines and all that stuff? So I said that, you know, one, I've always worked for a multinational bank with very strict corporate governance, with very strict responsibilities and roles. Uh, I've never worked for a corporation before, uh, let alone a family-owned corporation, let alone a Chinese family control. <laughs> so I really didn't know what to expect, but 
I, I told my wife that since I wasn't doing anything anyway, and I was actually getting bored, uh, I said, I'll just give it a try, and there's nothing to lose. So if it doesn't work out, I can always just resign and go back to retirement mode. <laughs> so I actually then moved back to the Philippines six years ago to join the SM Investments Group. Um, I haven't lived here for more than 20 years actually, but I've always had the longing to come back because it's still home. No matter what you say, the Philippines is still home for us Filipinos. Um, so I did come back, and it's been six years, and I haven't regretted a single day since I joined the group. Um, I was actually very surprised at how determined the family has been to professionalize the organization. Um, there's a saying that, I don't know whether some of you know, that normally they say that family businesses last three generations. The first generation starts it, the second generation builds it, and the third generation basically wastes it away, right? Uh, it doesn't mean that the company goes back to the third generation, it just means that it, I guess it doesn't grow as fast as it used to grow, or it sort of, sort of plateaus and actually goes down, right? Because as we all know, if we don't grow, we're actually stagnating and we lose market share, we lose everything, right? So in effect, our business is declining. So I, I personally know a lot of businesses that experience those three generation event, and I'm sure a lot of you do so as well. And I actually believe that the family behind SM is very, very conscious of that. That for the businesses to continue to grow and thrive, you need to professionalize. Um, and we've seen that happen. I don't know if most of you know, but the SM Investments is the largest market cap in the Philippines today. The second largest market cap is SM Prime, which is part of the group. And the third largest market, crime, market cap is BDO, which is also part of the group. So the three largest companies listed in the Philippine Stock Exchange are all SM Group companies. And together they represent almost 30% of the market cap of the PSE. I don't think any of this would have happened if they did not professionalize. Uh, I am the first non-family president of SM Investments. Uh, SM Prime is now also head of a non-family member, Jeffrey Lim, who became president maybe a year and a half to two years ago. And Nestor Tan heads BDO, who is also a non-family member. So I think it's very clear that professionalizing the organization is necessary to continue to grow and prosper, right? Um, and what's also very helpful, at least speaking of the African SM group, is that the professional managers actually see that the family members who are still involved in the group are even harder working than professionals. So there's like a model that you, we as professionals try to really work as hard, if not harder, than they do. You know? uh, it's very difficult to catch up with their, with their work habits, to be honest with you. But unlike First Philippine Holdings, and also that we are group, I guess First Philippine Holdings is third generation, we are first generation, SM is second generation. So we're right there in the middle. Uh, and because it's still a very relatively young group, I think what differentiates us as well is that the second generation who runs most of the business directions now and moving forward, it's still very, very entrepreneurial. So even though you professionalize, it is very important that the entrepreneurial nature of the organization stays. Because that's what will make us move faster and look after opportunities out there. Uh, I have seen companies in my previous experiences where they prefer
professional lives, and then they become very bureaucratic. So I always tell people that we end up hiring that bureaucracy is good, it's important to make sure that things work properly, but we cannot be bureaucratic because once we become bureaucratic, the entrepreneurial nature of the organization, the culture will change, and then our competitive advantage will go away as well. So that's sort of what I wanted to impart for now, and hopefully we'll get to discuss more in the Q&A portion. Thank you. that's where I'm coming from. I have since retired from Ayala, and I have gone into consulting for different companies in the Philippines. Um, I have only been employed by one non-family corporation, that's Intel, the, the manufacturing manufacturers, uh, or processors and semiconductors. Uh, I think all of us are in agreement that all of the Philippine corporations, most if not all of the Philippine corporations are really family corporations, both in genesis and in their genes. So family corporations are not really rare as far as the Philippines is concerned. Now the thing with family corporations is that there's a continuum of them. On, on, on one side, you have a family corporation, it's a listed corporation, uh, minimal presence of family members, a lot of the functions are being devoted to professional managers. And then on the other extremes are our uh, startups um, currently run by uh, founders. Because of the difference in the outlook and circumstances, uh, I, I'm very cautious about trying to generalize or give advice um, uh, right off uh, because uh, as you may imagine, it is very situational. So le later on in the Q&A, I, mean, I can only speak about my experiences. Um, the family is looking, when they look for a family uh, professional managers, the family is really looking for a uh, skills based requirement. Uh, they're look, usually looking for experience and credibility to fill gaps in the management. So, as you come in, it is important that you establish your credibility or your bona fides as an experienced and a credible guy. Uh, but then that just gets you in. That's, that's when the fun starts when you are already in. Uh, to be able to be effective, you need to understand the aspirations of the family and more importantly, the dynamics in the family. Um, it, as far as I'm concerned, it, in my consulting, it, it was very important for me in order to be effective that I do not lose that the perspective that I am just a mere custodian of their legacy. Their legacy is really composed of two things. One is reputation and the other concerns their assets. So uh, in, in whatever I do, uh, I do sometimes have um, family corps, I have some operational responsibility, 
I just make sure that the owners are uh, convinced or satisfied that we sort of have a shared destiny. Ano lang ako, I, I'm just a caretaker. Um, the responsibility, I, I think sometimes it's spoken, sometimes it's not spoken, is that there will be a turnover of this legacy, both reputationally and assets to the next generation of family. I am I'm also sure that you, you are aware that uh, trust and confidence are very precious commodities in a family corporation. You're an insider, and you're an outsider going into a closed system. So trust and confidence are really your most important commodities as they relate to the non-family members. The reason that this is important is that without the trust and confidence, you cannot really execute it. You will be second guessed. So that is, you get in with your credit and experience to be able to execute, you need to be careful about your uh, the trust and confidence that is entrusted in you. That's the default when you come in. They really want to trust you. They really want to give you your confidence. But that is so easy to lose. Now, when you come in, uh, let's say in my instance, um, obviously they have a realization that I have a contribution to make to the furtherance of their business. And um, at least in my case, I'm fortunate that the family side of the people are cognizant of this. Now, this cognizance took the form of the open-mindedness and candor that resulted in essentially a fair bit of leeway when it comes to decision, and then more importantly, forthrightness when it comes to discussions. Because ideas are ideas, eh? then the ideas have to come to fruition. And um, these ideas cannot add value until you can really execute on them. So right now, the, the perspective I'm going to adopt uh, during the Q&A is that of, of my role as a consultant with the uh, Arameta Group. Uh, as you can imagine, the Arameta Group, this is the uh, Tubao Arametas, uh, not the LBC or the Dragini Group. They are in a very interesting stage right now. They're in the second generation, the founder in the second generation, and issues of expansion and successions is, is very critical at this stage. My principles are about eight years old and third generation is not involved at all. Um, they have their own uh, enterprises. So we are going there at a, at a crucial time right now. Um, this group is in the consumer. Uh, they, they, they own the Pizza Hut, Taco Bell, Dairy Queen. And uh, aside from the real estate in Cuba, they have a few thousand hectares in the east. Um, so so that, that is a... Uh, a, a crucial time in, in their history. And as, as you can imagine, um, you can go forward if you don't have a succession plan. So the governance is different. Um, when I was in Singapore, obviously there are two guys looking over your shoulder. They're equivalent of the SEC. Uh, it's rather scary to sign documents in Singapore. And then you have your other, because we're in club investments, private equity investments, and direct investments, so you have a certain amount of governance. Uh, in the U.S., it's the same. Um, I, I came in there right about the time that, um, that there were um, regulations, and then I moved back to the Philippines. Um, I, I had a short stint with the Ortigas group. I was the first non-Ortigas president and CEO, and then I moved to to Mr. Dinuncio, I was really retired. Um, I was just uh, following my kids along in the U.S. just in college until I, I um, received a call from the patriarch of the Arameta group. And to their credit, they knew the situation. They knew that the issue was succession. They knew that there was business expansion happening. Now anyway, um, in conclusion, um, there, there's only really one word that really defines what a professional manager in a family corporation should be always aware of. That is legacy. Legacy is very important to these people. Um, and then as far as legacy is concerned, legacy cannot just be transferred. 
you will have to set up structures, set up and rebuild and make sure that, or hope that they last. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rizinto, and to all our speakers. Another round of applause for everybody. Okay, um, we will now start the Q&A session. Um, we, a while ago, we announced already that we have um, pieces of paper given to you, and if you would like to write down your questions, please give them to our, um, our interns over here. Thank you, the ones in the middle and here over at my right. Um, I would like to invite our esteemed guest speakers back on stage, which they already are in. <laughs> okay, um, the session will be moderated by Professor Jenny Santiago, to my far um, left, the Massive and Sarala Burma Professional Chair in Asian Family Corporations. Dr. Jenny is an author of the book, The Family Incorporated, Lessons from Filipino Business Families, and the book is available outside if you would like to purchase at a national bookstore. Everybody, let's start with the question and answer. Okay, good morning, everyone. Good morning. So, the format of our QA, I would just have an initial question which they can answer. I would like it to have a conversation so we can ask each other as well. And then after that, we will open it up to the, to the audience for the questions. But we just had a phone questions. So we, we, we gave them a series of questions that, a list of questions that you have listed during the registration process. Initially, the, the reason why we came out with this forum is that, uh, so I talk to families, and they're at that stage where they want to professionalize, right? Some of them actually do hire, and then the, there's a, some sort of frustration on the part of the professional manager. So when they join, uh, they, the, family mem the family business owner knows they need to expand, right? And they need professionals. And but when the person comes in, there's some uh, tension between the two. So can you just uh, share with us how, if you experience such a ten that such a tension, and how to go how, how to work around? Anyone that mic is there? Thank you. Since I was the one who arrived four years ago, even though I have ten years of experience with him. The tension, I would say, is again, making sure that my values and the way they do things there match again. That, that, and, and I noticed that even when we hire professional managers, because when I uh, rejoined, um, when I rejoined, I was already 52. And I noticed that was the time that Mr. Villar started hiring because the growth was so fast as, as in the past four, seven years, eight years, that he simply had to hire from the outside experienced people. The first thing that we noticed was that we had to, or I, I had to be guided by people who are 20 years in the business again, because otherwise I could not adjust very fast because there was no written formal organizational structure. So that caddy was around three to six months. I survived because I'm now four years. There are those who don't survive. Why? Because they were not able to adjust to the corporate culture. They, they thought that, okay, they hired me for my talent, therefore I have to show it right away. Mm -hmm. And as uh, Roel pretty much mentioned, you have to understand the dynamics not just of the of let's say Mr. Manny Villar, you will have to see who are his trusted advisors, you, his most trusted, and then down the line, then you will know what to do because you may really have to sell your idea to those people before you get your final approval. It's not politics; it's basically understanding the dynamics in a family corporation. So you're speaking about adjustments you made. How about adjustments? Family owners have to, well, they basically interview you so they know your background. And um, I wish I, I don't say too much, but the people skills of Mr. Manu Villar is excellent. Uh, when he talks to you, even though you are staff, you are officer, uh, 
as if you're the most important person in front of him. So that is key, but actually he listens to you a lot and he knows a lot about you already. So when he talks to you, he doesn't come out empty-handed. He already has certain ideas and he wants to confirm whether it is consistent with what he thinks or not. So I would say, so long as, as everybody has that technique, which, which I do, uh, then that's the way I adjust to the new people who come in. I have to know them and make sure I know that there's a fit, uh, competence-wise, and there's a fit culture-wise. So we have male bosses, owners, but you have a female boss. Well, Any difference? <laughs> I think just to follow up, um, it, it's really a relationship, right, between the professional manager and the business owner. On the one hand, the business owner has, it's not just lip service that they want to professionalize, right? The, the, the real intention has to be there so that there's a lot more flexibility both sides. Uh, and for the professional manager, you can't just go in there and expect to do what you've been doing before the say the multinational and this is the way it should be done to do it, right? There has to be flexibility on both sides. So a lot of personalities have to sort of shell this yeah. right? uh, Both the business owner has to give you a chance and you also need to be flexible enough to adapt to the working style and uh, like I said earlier, the vision and the mission of the business owner. But the key as well as been mentioned is really the trust. Um, professional managers would be a lot more successful if they really have the trust of the business owners because then there's a lot more sort of um, freedom, if I may call it that, to, to actually you know, implement policies, decisions, and execute on those things uh, if the business owners trust you. So, in fact, whenever I hire people as well, I keep on telling them that the key is that we cannot lose the trust that the business owners have in us because once that trust is gone, it's going to be a very difficult working environment because they will always be second guessing you and questioning your motives and all that, right? So, so that is the key. But whether you're a family business owner or whether you're a professional organization, finding the right people for the right organization culture is extremely important and it's not easy to find. Uh, just a um, few words of reflecting on the presentation. And then, and I've known Ricky for 20 plus years probably. Um, I don't know well for that time. Yeah, so, <laughs> so there's some commonality here. But I, 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 I was just reflecting on my own journey, right? Uh, and uh, maybe a little bit different from uh, my peers here. <coughs> is, uh, uh, like I said, I was working for the investment bank. But I joined the group 20 years ago. I'm 53 this year. Uh, 54, turning 54 this year. So if you draw about 20 years ago, when I joined, I was probably, I came in as a vice president and uh, uh, at the age of 33, relatively young. Uh, but at the time, I had a, essentially a, an expertise in investment banking. And again, we were in, in a large way into power generation. Uh, power generation was a small business in, in the first world school. But we grew that from being a, a small contributor contributor of earnings to what it is now, which is the day. Um, so when I contemplate on that, um, various family owners have to figure this out as well, which is, do you bring in a more seasoned, seasoned uh, professional manager at the top, or do you bring in someone probably has not gotten, gotten to his peak at a sort of a, 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 a different level? So those are the things that probably, uh, you know, a family business owner who has a long-term vision and is trying to figure out, okay, where will I be in the next 10, 20, 30 years? 
what kind of organization will I need in the next 10, 20, 30 years? And it's probably going to be a combination of all of that, bringing in senior and also bringing in people at, who have not yet peaked, but who are willing to grow with you. Uh, and that's, that's, um, that's a, to be honest, I never thought that I would be uh, the president of here, two listed, two listed companies. Uh, I never, that was not, that was farthest from my ambition. I thought that because it was a family-owned business, it would always be headed by a local family member. And to my surprise, when the chairman of Eric retired and then the chairman was, uh, the current chairman <coughs> was elevated to his chairmanship role, he asked me to become the president. And I told him, do you, re do you really want me to be the president? Because my expertise is really in finance. I would be happy to be essentially the finance guru of the of the group, and, and I think that would be my most valuable. But he said no, I want to do. So in a way, it's also been helpful to me uh, that you don't have. I don't know whether ambitious. Uh, you don't have to be overly ambitious, but actually, I would imagine in this in this forum here, but the commonality is one where there's probably a, a lot of humility uh, involved, and then. Actually, because you, you, you play that role, you're actually given a role that's probably more, more higher than what you ever thought you'd be, you know, you would have accomplished in your career. What was the um, In my experience, I, 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 I can confidently say that the owners, when they bring in professional managers, the owners really want it to work. So when the professional managers come in, have it, cannot come into the car company without their trust and confidence. It's already there. The theory is not to lose it. They want it to work. That's, that's for sure. So if they do not uh, bring in professional managers thinking that it may not work, they really want to make it work. So with that attitude, the guy coming in already has some thing to work with. Um, now again, like I said earlier, it is not to lose the trust and confidence, but I can really say that the owners really want to make it. Okay, just to because a while ago you mentioned that uh, for the Lopez group, they, they, they're they able to tell the family members, unless you're qualified, um, that's the only reason you can join, right? So there, there's a question, and how, how, how do they manage it? You said they're still, Still being pressured to hire, but how does he manage? Painfully. <laughs> it's very. Uh, I mean, uh, again, uh, it's 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 a situation where he has to have very candid conversations with the most senior members of the family and to say, where do we want to be? What kind of organization do we want to have? If we do this and we bring in all these people without their relevant experience, then. You can see that it might even demotivate the professional managers. So there's that balance that you have to take into consideration. And again, the credit helps because again, it's it's one where the perspective that you have to take is a long-term perspective. And as you nurture your your either your siblings or your children to take more responsibility, that's the that's the more that's the that's the crux of it, which is how do you make sure that you develop that and at the same time develop the company the company's objectives properly so that you can professionalize and bring in the best people. Because actually what you want to do is actually bring in the best people around. It. Because that will that will that will I think that will that's the probably the way to to, to success. Um, my my first career after this school is really with the IRP. Um, at that time, it's probably the most below family corporation, and similar to what Mr. Kuno said. Um, at that time, believe it or not, uh, the Ayala group was not as big. Um, the business interests were still quite limited, and, and they wanted to expand, so they realized that they needed professional managers, and, and like Mr. Kuno, what Mr. Kuno said, they knew that by the presence of many family members, by his life of the recruiting efforts and the development of these managers. But um, there's also, from what I understand, there's some kind of 
family traditional constitution uh, that limits the number of family members in the IR group. Um, they have a very strict retirement policy. Everyone retires at 60, regardless uh, if you're a sole belt. Uh, JCA, the father of Fernando and Jaime, retired at 60, and I'm quite sure that Fernando and Jaime will also retire at, at 60. So the, the, the families are um, very cognizant that they, it, it cannot exist together. If you want the best, you, you will have to give them, you, you, you have to break that glass ceiling for non professionals. And then one of the signals that you send out is that this is really a merit base. And, and to add, um, in terms of governance, they, I don't think we could have operated in Singapore and the United States the way we did if we had operated similar to a family corporation. In Singapore, the United States are very different. Choosing the styles of shoes 
in in the uh, you know in for the department store. So I guess that is the answer to that. But in relation to what Freddie said, we are caretakers. When I was rehired, Mr. Vigar told me two things that I should do. Of course, your role really as a professional manager is to make the business grow. The business of business is to grow, and, and that's why we're all here as, as managers. That's a given. Number two, I'm supposed to train the people who will be under Paolo Villar and Camille Villar. So that means uh, making sure that um, the values are there and the style of managing of the father, of which he trained us, because we're the first batch of management trainees. In a way, we also take care of the children when they're in front of other people. We basically, they're younger, like how old is Paolo? Paolo is about 42. So, there will be meetings that we will be uh, presiding, and we will have to make sure that we actually have the right signals so that we understand each other in issues that we have to disagree before, and agree to disagree before the meeting. So that way we're able to somehow train, train the, the younger batch, the second generation. So that's one of the roles that I, I have. say influence them to follow the right, right track, influence the BDRs, or influence the other party? No, I, I, I should know where your reference is. Influence the, the BDRs. The BDRs, to take the right track, okay. That is a very interesting question. Okay, when you say the right track, you're, uh, I would like to understand, is there um, an advocacy that you would like to, because I want to make sure I answer it correctly. But in the earlier presentation of Mr. Puno, mm -hmm. he, uh, he highlighted certain values like mm -hmm. uh, nationalism, mm -hmm. uh, caring for others. Uh, you know, you know, when we care for others, it, it requires a little bit of sacrifice on our part. You know? uh, so, so, uh, so I think right means doing the right, following the right way. Um, nationalism, you're saying that basically we're also a political, a political figure, Senator Villar, in the case of Senator Cynthia Villar. Let's put it this way. I, I will try to divide it into two parts. One would be the environment and one would be the real estate part, so that I cover both. For the environment, um, real estate can be both destructive but at the same time it actually allows for development which improves the quality of life. Let's put it this way from the environment part, even though some people may not be aware of it because we don't really uh, publicize that we are involved in mining. Um, four years, yeah, four years, five years ago, um, Paulo Villar made an investment in mining. It's known as DDIRD and uh, Basically, it has a Canadian um, 
part of it is 30% Canadian, the rest is PBR. It is the most responsible uh, mining company in the Philippines right now. And purposely, when they were choosing investments, because of the advocacy of the mom, Senator Cynthia Villar, it had to be uh, responsible. So in what way is it responsible? From the Mining Act of 1995, which introduced the rehabilitation program for mining, uh, we would we are the first one who has successfully rehabilitated a mine, a gold and copper mine in Sambuanga, Cebuay, and I am a witness to that. So, is there a conflict of interest on the part of mining? You would say that in the early stages, probably of a company, fast growth, you would have shortcuts, and those shortcuts. I would say are being uh, realized right now and they're trying to be more friendly to the environment. On the real estate side, that is, I would say, the tricky part. Because as you grow uh, bigger, there would be several stakeholders when you consolidate land. And uh, whether you like it or not, the most important uh, component to increase the value of land, and I know that, um, I hope I don't hurt Roel here. <laughs> we are in a very uh, prime piece of property of which um, not, I am sure it is by design that uh, ETSA is running through two major roads of uh, Ayala, which is basically uh, Paseo de Roja, no, it's Ayala Avenue and Lumia, or Center Hill Puya. Uh, roads like uh, SLEX ramps, which end up with uh, use of property or with the property of um, the campuses, rebuild. So what am I saying? Maybe I'm justifying real estate from my point of view, real estate development from my point of view. But infrastructure and making it happen really requires private sector and the public sector being combined. It so happened that uh, Mr. Vidar and Senator Cynthia Vidar are both, they're both in business. And so there would be conflicts. And the only way I could say that it will be better is that you have to use size and growth at a certain point to bring back the idea of nationalism and to bring back the idea of um, environment, protecting the environment. Um, it will happen, it is already happening. And um, give us a chance, we're first generation as against third generation. So I'm, I'm so happy that uh, Dr. Santiago, Jeannie, really made us one, two, three, four, because really Ayala is probably the fourth or fifth generation. Ayala is a 180 year old organization. He is 90, he is probably 60, and I'm 42. So that's all I would say. Give us all a chance, but all I would say is that the business of business is to grow, and growth is able to cure if we're able to give back to the community, to the country. I hope I answered your question. Yes. <laughs> I, I'm Nick Ladvan. I used to teach here. Uh, one of the problems of family corporation is attracting good talent. And we have quite a few of them here. Except for two of you who are very big, SM and the office group. People, good people, will look at the, your historical <coughs> companies as having a, quote unquote, a glass ceiling. Hanggang dito lang ang makakarating ang dyan na naman sa family member. How do you think these small companies will so that they can attract with people. Let me take a crack at that. I, I think for the smaller businesses, right? Um, providing some share incentive, in my mind, it's very important because even for the professional manager, there's the feeling of actual ownership. Um, so that even though you have a glass ceiling that let's say one entity that EDP 
level, for example, you will still feel that you're a meaningful owner of the company, so you will still do as much as you can to increase the value. Because at the end of the day, you know, it, it's ownership that really drives how hard somebody works in the company. But, but, but that is contrary to how this But but that again that that's where the conflict that's where the conflict is right do you want do you want to grow or are you happy being the way you are now chugging along and as others grow around you you're gonna actually be declining so that's the question I know that so because I I actually dealt with a number of family-owned businesses here who had difficulties in a generational change. Right? Because the current generation are not is as interested, so they'd rather sell out. So if that's if that's the intention, then that's the direction, right? You sell out and monetize your your holding, then you lose your family business. Yeah, but there's also the other side of money venture. Quite a few believe in legacy. Right. Yeah. Again, that, that's where the issue is, right? So if if the intention is to build the legacy, and, and that's something that's been imparted to the next generations, and then to retain that legacy, you need to grow. It's very difficult to grow, again, if you rely only on family members. And that's where to attract this new talent from outside, in my opinion, you need to be able to give some equity participation in the company. I totally agree with what you're saying, which is um, in public companies, you have stock ownership. In private companies, there's profit sharing. So probably being clear about that, it, it could be a situation where, as painful as it is, a professional manager in Ringgit maybe even be paid more than your children. And they have to say that's, that's justifiable. Because otherwise, we would not be able to hire this guy who has a degree uh, and then all this experience. Otherwise, your businesses, that legacy aspect of it, will not, will not succeed. And if, if the legacy is important, if the long-term vision is important, then, and, and you want to succeed, you want to thrive, then all of these have to be taken into consideration. Yeah, I agree with that. There is vision and there is uh, the desire from me. And I think that is the legacy. So you can't stay where you are. Because if you stay where you are and you call that legacy, you cannot attract talent. Because you will not grow. So this ambitious person who wants to just, you know, has all this energy, where do you put it? So you will have to have a vision that really motivates, inspires that person. But you cannot be all words. You have to execute, you have to grow. That person may not be the head of the big company, but that person can be the head of many small companies. And, and that is actually the difference where Mr. Vidar does it right now. He gives responsibilities early, so that the entrepreneurial spirit of the young, talented professionals are tested early. And, and, and the, 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 how would I say, the foundation of that is really, as what Giles, Freddy, and myself say, you have to grow. You have to grow. Uh, they are big conglomerates. We are medium conglomerate, but in the sense that the legacy is to grow. It's not to stay where you are. Um, when, I, when I said that not all family corporations are the same, uh, to a certain extent, by and large, that's true. But one thing that is consistent, as far as I have observed, is that when they bring in professional managers, it is for the corporations to grow. They don't bring in professional managers just to stay put or run in place. Um, again, I, I go back to my stint with the Ayadas. It, 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 it's like, um, 
it's like a wheel. They, they brought us in. Um, I, I remember when they brought us in, Ayala was just off, I think, a five or seven year hiding piece. Uh, there was a distinct difference from the guys they brought in, myself, and the ages of the next guys. But then as, as the group grew, there were more and more professional managers. So they grew because of professional managers, and then there were more professional managers because they had to grow. But then, when we were there, at least when I was there, I mean, I knew that there were reserve positions, uh, and, and, and sometimes it is a, a bonus that you suddenly find yourself sitting at the top of the hill, but the top of the hill is still relative because the guys sitting on the mountain are still owners. Uh, I, I, I have been basically managing director, president, CEO of, of Singapore, US, but they both so well by it. I, I mean, it, it's relative. Uh, all I'm saying is, whatever the circumstances of family corporations are, they bring in professional managers to grow. And they will only continue to grow and be able to bring in professional managers because of growth. So, so it, it's just a cycle. Yeah. That's that's what, what I observe. Yeah. Uh, but uh, what happens uh, with, with some of these medium sized firms is that uh, they're so used to decision making, the owners, <laughs> and then the professional manager comes in. So, how do they manage that? Who has to make that adjustment? The, whoever would be, let's say, Desi or probably, um, who would be the Lopez? Six, six, uh, Federico, uh, Fe Federico. Federico Lopez, or in the case of uh, Aramentan. Okay, anyway, uh, in our case, it's Manny Villar. Um, let's put it this way, because they are owners and they're managing, they have a way of getting information from different perspectives. So that when they listen to you, they already are prepared. That, that's all I can say. So it's not like they're coming out and they trust you, take note of that. Otherwise, you may in fact be the last person that they will consult. But they already consulted a lot of people. That, that's all I can say. <laughs> so many perspectives. I've been working with uh, our chairman. Uh, he was one of the hired people I've been working for the last 20 years. So in a way, uh, I have the benefit of almost like he moves there. I know his movement. He knows my movement. Uh, and actually, we have, an, we have a core team where we've developed uh, such good collaboration and synergy that you know people have a role to play. Uh, and it's I think it's a system that he himself and he himself uh, believes in. And so, uh, you know, you really have to develop that system. But I think what is critical is at the end of the day, does he want, does, does he treasure, does, 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 does he value the, the honesty of the conversations that you have with him or with her? I think that's important. Uh, and I think as professional managers, the moment that honesty disappears, then probably, you'll also know it's time to move on. And so the question really for you is that, you know, when it's time to move on, you also have to have that ability to walk away. And, and for me, uh, I've always, I, I see myself as always been a professional manager. And uh, I'm willing to walk away the moment I see that honesty disappears. And, and it's like, and, and so it, it, in that sense, it's, it's no different from working with a family basis than it is with a multinational. Because the moment you feel unhappy, you will know what it, what it, what it, you know what, that you are unhappy. You also know that you have the best job in the world. Uh, and so, uh, and so I, I'm fortunate because I feel right now I have the best job in the world, right? But tomorrow, it could change. We also have to realize that there's enough humility here. You have to have enough, enough of um, an understanding about what makes you happy and, and say, well, I'm going to walk away the moment it doesn't, 
just work. You know, I have a little, a little mood when I'm dealing with uh, my principles. Number one is that I make sure I know that I know. And number two, I make sure that I know what I don't know. Um, because if you fail in that second aspect, your trust and confidence goes down. And, and again, in my experience, trust and confidence are the most precious ones. You are going into the corporation, they're willing to trust and put their confidence in you. Once you lose it, that's gone. So as far as I'm concerned, if I don't know, I make sure that I know what I do not know. And I tell them that I do not know. It's, that's, that, it's, it's a slippery slope if you try to manage it that you think you know. Since there 20 years, was there any difference from Oscar? Was it Oscar 20 yes, years ago? Yes, yes. After today? Did uh, it change? Definitely. Uh, the style is totally different. Okay. Uh, when you, but also, I, maybe, maybe I think it's interesting to note where the transition from second to third uh, was not an also an easy decision. There was not an also, it was also not a very easy move on the part of the second generation. And I, I, I was quite, uh, uh, you know, I, went, I, I witnessed it, but essentially when you when you hand on the baton, that's also very painful for the second generation. <coughs> and in many organizations, the second generation never disappears. So it's a question of style. But in the case of first baby movie, um, Oscar Lopez, Currently, still the chairman emeritus. Okay, really chose that. Okay, I hand it on to you. Uh, his nickname is Vicky Lopez, and um, it's yours. That's I think that's not, maybe that's probably not as usual uh, in the context of a family business, especially from a founder who will make it. Who will be, who, especially in first generation, will be second generation. But in this case, it's second to third. And you can imagine, uh, probably the biggest transition would be third to fourth. Because then the ownership would have been widely held. And that will be, that will be, uh, that will be a challenge. Hi, um, thank you very much for the speakers, for all the insights. I'm Margo, I'm a little diver. Now, um, I'm sure that you've had a lot of challenges. All of you have had a lot of challenges. What would have been the biggest challenge and how did you overcome it? In, in my case, the biggest challenge really is, is the understanding the dynamics. Uh, again, I have to hold on to that trust and confidence. Because I mean, you go into a company, there's a certain gifts that the owners are willing to give you. But those things you have, to, it's just like you know, a car. It needs maintenance. So the, the biggest challenge for me is that I have to say what I think they need to hear in a way that they will have an open mind. Um, the other challenge I face is that when you set up structures that are clearly geared towards, for lack of a better word, making the family dynamics redundant and implementing it, that's another challenge. Because as, as Cynthia said, there are certain unofficial tenets, there are certain unofficial structures of how companies are governed. But once you are there and you have to professionalize the governance, the decision making, the feedback system, what are you essentially trying to do? That's, that's the difficult piece that I have. Um, 
I never dreamed that I will be involved in a company that has a political uh, a politician. And um, when Mr. Villar joined, uh, became a congressman, I, I told him that um, once you put me in the political organization, I will resign because uh, I am ready for business. So, but then you're correct, they are sometimes together. So how do I deal with that? Mm -hmm. Well, basically I had to understand how many political parties are there, which party they belong to, and then I have to figure out when I talk to local government units, which party they belong to, so that I basically tread carefully when I introduce myself. And then uh, some of them are friends, some of them are not. But since they're politicians, well, they're always friends. So uh, all I could say is that I had to learn that because that was not part of my uh, skills. I just basically uh, say, how are you? What's wrong with us? So that part, yeah, I, I had to learn that. That was a challenge to me. Good morning, everyone. My name is Claire Bernabe. I am a hotelier, and I've also experienced working for family organizations and multinational companies. Question being is, um, was there ever a specific situation working with the families uh, when their directive went against your principle? Uh, did you have to make a stand, uh, you know, talking about humility by Mr. Buller earlier. Was the decision easy to just follow what the directive from the top was? Or did you have to stick with your values and your principle? And how did you uh, manage it forward? forward? I, can, I can honestly say in my side that I've never had an experience where, uh, you know, you're talking about sort of a uh, Deferring conflict, particular about the value side. Maybe I'm, I, I don't know, maybe I'm lucky, but uh, uh, I think it's not been an issue for me, for me uh, personally. Um, but at the same time, uh, you know, uh, again, as I say, it's a, it's a journey. We, we continue to have sort of regular conversations. Um, I guess in our, in our case, we're, uh, as a group, uh, <coughs> quite known, but uh, I, I think our biggest challenge in our case is really the fact that uh, the family, in fact, sticks by its values. And sometimes it gets into trouble because of its values, particularly because we have a media business that's actually, in a way, we don't, I'm not connected with the media business, but when the media business becomes unpopular, we also become unpopular. So it's not, uh, it's not easy for us to, to, to try because that's effectively part and partial of, we're not into politics and yet we get <laughs> probably the, uh, the effect of being political. Uh, and that's, 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 that's more difficult for us. But uh, I, it's fair to say that as far as values are concerned, it's not been an issue for us. Uh, it's been sometimes an issue for our business. I have also been fortunate not to be put in that situation for a uh, Business disagreements, that happens. As a matter of fact, that's supposed to happen because you have to test the vigorously test the ideas and the moral. I've had a long career come to think of it and never been put in that situation. How about the situation? I, I, I know that each of you are just re reporting to just one family member, or if there are multiple family members and there's conflict among them, are you drawn in into that? Are you trying to go into that conversation? And how is it happening? The, 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 the longest group has gone through ups and downs. And so 20 years, by definition, I would have gone through the ups and downs as well. Um, so for example, a few years back when we sold their stakes in their alcohol, that was very painful for the family. Uh, and it obviously, I was involved in the, the whole transaction of unloading the shares. But at the same time, uh, you can see that it was, it was painful for the family. Uh, I think it was unfair. Fairness to it, uh, but having said. 
said that uh, we have to move on. You know, we have to, sometimes you, you get hit in the face and you just have to move on. Uh, because, you know, uh, you still have the substantial assets to, to, that you are made responsible for. Um, so, you know. You've never been caught in between two opposing. Oh, we have, I have. Yeah. So, uh, again, it's, it's, it's one where they have to, Ultimately, there's a decision that has to be made. You cannot, by having an impasse, at least you also made a decision not to do anything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, so when there's an impasse, there's no decision. That means there's a decision that's been made, which is nothing's going to happen. Right? But, uh, but generally, uh, you know, you eventually come to uh, a eventually make a decision, and uh, the family sort of uh, the family. they are pretty much they, they fight in the house so by the time they see us it's pretty much uh, done already the only difference really would be the styles the style of Senator Cynthia Villar, the style of Mr. Manny Villar, the style of the son but pretty much they're, they're, they're a solid group um, uh, again I'm fortunate that in most of the time, there's a very strong leader figure, but that's because you're near to the generation of the founder. Um, it, it, the probability of another type A personality in succeeding generations actually increases exponentially. Uh, I have been involved in a company um, that you know, uh, there are conflicts on the directions that they wish to go. That's when you have to test what you are. And because at that point, you have to be very objective. Because you will realize that these are these, those things are their assets, and they are really the prerogative of, of the disposition and use of the assets. Are you the owners? Um, so you have to be very objective without making a judgment on which is the correct position to take, especially if you are the leader at that point. Um, unfortunately, I'm covered by an NDA. <laughs> I cannot really discuss that uh, company. But then you will you have to understand and accept that you are a custodian and the disposition of the assets are the uh, rows uh, rests with the shareholders. There's no right or wrong on, on the direction you're going to take. And and that's that's really a very difficult position to be in. That's their money, that's their asset. How do they dispose of it? Your role as a professional manager is to make sure that it, it, it is the most appropriate decision. At that point of disposition, there's no best decision, it's just the most appropriate. And, and that's really a difficult uh, situation because that, my situation at that time is I was at the level almost of a tiebreaker. If I move towards one group, that group wins. If I move towards another group, that group wins. So you have to make sure that you, you don't have that hubris to think that you're an owner. At that point, you have to be very clear that there's no right or wrong way to go. That way, I'm okay. I was going to say, I think that's actually another role of the professional manager. If, if let's say the, the business owners, the siblings, or cousins, or whoever uh, have some differences or conflicts, that's where I think the professional manager will also need to step in and speak to the different people individually, right? Uh, and explain the situation objectively. And at the end, there's always going to be some kind of a compromise because without emotions, right? That's normally what happens with these business owners if emotions come into play. But when there's a third party 
non-family who will explain things clearly and objectively to them, there's always going to be a middle ground that people would agree on. So we have time for one more question. My name is Nestor Godin. I put up a company and I'm in my second generation now. I'm the first generation. And that's the person started. Uh, if your second generation is not interested in what you're doing, obviously you have to either sell off or you look for somebody else to some, somebody you can trust. So you mentioned, some of you mentioned that there should be a little co ownership. I wish I could talk to the owners so I can ask how much percent of the ownership are you willing to let go to the professional managers. But this time I'm going to ask this from the four of you. What is a good rule of thumb of percent ownership that we're talking about? <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to answer it if you want to share it. It's okay. Uh, no, actually ownership can be notional. And notional, I mean by cert, you set a certain percentage of your net income <coughs> as, as profit shares without letting go of actual ownership. So it, in a sense, that's notional ownership because you know, if you own a 5% share of the business, naturally you get 5% share of the profits. So, but most family corporations, they are not too willing to let go of the equity. So well, what happens there is that they sort of give them a Equity, which comes in a certain percentage of the net income given to the managers. Okay, thank you. Response. I think um, profit sharing is, is one thing, but for other people, it's, it's the value of the business. Though. Because you could be making, let's say, a million pesos a year, and you say you share 10% of that. But then the value of the business continues to grow because when you eventually sell, it's a multiple of that, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so I think in addition to the tenor profit sharing, to me, the actual ownership in the valuation of the business itself is a big attraction uh, for people, right? So if you're gonna hire me, I'll say 100% ownership. <laughs> <laughs> No, but, but, but seriously, equity ownership uh, is actually a very good incentive, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you give something up front, right? It could be in the form of, let's say, a restricted stocks that's over five years or over 10 years, uh, so that you know if this person is the one you really want to retain, mm -hmm. then there's an incentive for you to stay because you can grow the business. And you all just you need to have also like exit process that if for some reason it doesn't work out, you don't want him to own your your shares in the company moving forward, right? So it, it's there's a lot of different uh, structures you can actually do to attract these people. But but ultimately there is a there's usually a short term and long term perspective. Right? Uh, so when you look at profit sharing, by definition profit sharing seems to be a short term. Because you know, okay, how much did you make last year? Okay, this is what I'll share amongst the management group. There's a pot, right? Saying, okay, this is what goes to the shareholders, but let's say 10, 15%, 20, whatever that amount is. No? Uh, and it, it's not only a percentage, it's based on you know, how material the amount is. Say, okay, this is what I'll share amongst the, the uh, executives or the guys who run the business, not simply the owner, that's why. The other is on ownership. You know, if the guy's unhappy, he gets he gets what typically happens in even in the multinational, if there's a bonus pool and it's shared amongst, and the guy's not happy with uh, with their uh, with what they got, they leave anyway. And so the ownership, in that sense, is important because the ownership is really part of a what they call a retention program. You want to retain your best talents, right? Because you're so comfortable dealing with those talents, but if you don't properly incentivize them, then and so it's
it's what they call it. You have there and there there's an art and a science to it. So there's no specific formula to talent retention. And so when you think about that, those are the things that you have to go through, which is there's a short-term perspective to it, which is probably profit sharing, but there's also a long-term perspective to it. And as great leader Art Riley points out, if there is a share ownership perspective to it, then then it need not be given to them day one. Depending on how the company performs, you get this these shares will they call it vesting, they these shares will be made effective from year one to year five. And so you get the full benefit if you stay here for the next five years. So th there's a lot of, but uh, uh, you know, you, I'm sure you can hire consultants that can help you and say, okay, this is how we're going to do it. At the risk of oversimplifying, I am a skill small. You're looking forward to the performance bonuses. A zip group, you're looking forward to the stock of things rather than the performance bonus. Yes. Uh, belonging to the youngest company, now I could see the future of the <laughs> next set of managers after me. Well, basically, we have the performance bonus. And when there is another company that will go public, he gives us token, token shares. But I would say that probably the second generation will probably move in towards what uh, Mr. Freddy and Giles uh, yeah, are mentioning. So it's, it's an evolution, so, so that is good. Thank you so much to our speakers for answering our queries. Um, let us now welcome um, Ms. Lily Lumatbas, our research manager at Perla, to present her summary of the conversations. And may we, may we request the speakers and Dr. Jenny to stay on stage. Hi, good morning. Uh, yeah. So much stories of wisdom, and I really do not know if I will be able to give justice no, in this recapping of what we have heard and what we have listened to. But um, the way I see it, uh, non-family managers and family business leaders, you have a sort of like special kind of symbiotic relationship. Family business leaders, for you to be able to sustain growth in your business, you need to have non-family managers who come in with their excellent credentials and credibility. But this is only the initial phase. This is the initial phase. What is crucial is the second phase, which is the enhancement and uh, maintenance of this initial phase. And our speakers have informed us, how do we do this? We do this by nurturing the legacy. Nurturing the legacy involves two dimensions, the wealth legacy and the values legacy, and both are of equal importance. Wealth legacy, business is business, and non-managers recognize and share the same goals with the family business leaders that we have to have sustainable growth for the business. But at the same time, they also embrace the same value, same value system, and as they have shared to us, trust, confidence, humility, humility, that you are not the owner, you are the caretaker, and understanding, understanding the dynamics and the dynamics of the family business that, so that you become sharers of the same values. So in this way, these two phases, the initial phase of excellence and the second phase of embracing the legacy, I think fits matches and enhances the, the unique relationship, symbiotic relationship between non-family leaders and family business leaders. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Lily, for the closing remarks. Um, on behalf of the Basant and Sarada Berla Professional Chair in Asian Family Corporations, we would like to thank you, everybody, for joining us here today. And in lieu of the registration fee that everyone has um, pre-purchased for today, we would like to invite you to answer our survey for our breakfast forum for academic use and on the 
and especially on the impact of corporate reputation on consumer decision making in the context of real estate investment. So we have that up on the email that we've sent you as you registered. So Henry, if you could kindly do so answer our um, survey, we would very appreciate we would be very appreciative of it. Um, thank you. And we would now like to present our tokens of appreciation to our speakers given by Dr. Ginny Santiago. So we will be Especially our breakfast.